Hello, my name is Yorgo Gushi. I am a qualified professional with a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science degree from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Electrical and Computer Engineering. My expertise lies in the areas of wireless communications and signal processing, which have been the focal points of my academic and professional journey. I would like to welcome you to Generalized Physical and System Architecture of 5G. This microcourse uses a holistic approach to describe the general physical and system architecture of the 5G network. This approach introduces us to 5G, its significance in today's world, and some of the fundamental technical concepts related to the network's architecture. In this microcourse, hands-on exploration of the 5G architecture will be performed using the 5G toolbox and several ready-made exercises to provide individuals with a starting point for understanding the operations of this telecommunication system. In lecture one, we are going to introduce 5G as a concept and dive deeper into its physical architecture. Let me start by giving a brief overview of lecture one. We will start with the lecture scope and cover the evolution of wireless communication technologies. Further, we will proceed with describing the differences between 5G and 4G LTE. We'll talk about the different ways of connecting in a 5G network, and we'll end the lecture with the fundamentals of the 5G medium access control. As part of the scope of this micro course, we are going to cover the physical and medium access control layers from a theoretical and applied perspective. We're going to talk about radio resource management in 5G and talk about 5G waveform generation in general. A quick disclaimer, please note, that while there exist various modeling and analysis tools for 5G, within the scope of this microcourse, our references are specifically related to the utilization of the 5G toolbox from the MathWorks. The evolution of wireless communication technologies from 1G to 5G has been a transformative journey marked by significant advancements in data rates, signal types, capabilities, device sizes, and overall communication paradigms. Here's an overview of the key components at each generation. 1G, or the first generation, was introduced in the 1980s. The data rates included analog voice calls with data rates around 2.4 kilobits per second. Analog signal transmission used frequency division multiple access, or FDMA. Its capabilities were limited to voice calls and lacked data services. The device sizes were very large and bulky analog mobile phones. First generation wireless technology laid the groundwork for mobile communication, primarily enabling voice calls over wireless networks. The second generation introduced in the early 1990s. Digital communication with data rates up to 64 kilobits per second using technologies like GSM or Global System for Mobile Communications and CDMA or Code Division Multiple Access. The signal type was a digital signal transmission using Time Division Multiple Access or TDMA. Its capabilities included introducing text messaging or SMS and basic data services like GPRS and Edge. Mobile phones for 2G became smaller and more portable compared to 1G devices. 2G introduced a paradigm shift. It brought digital communication, enabling more efficient use of the spectrum and paving the way for the basic data services. Moving forward with 3G, or the third generation, which was introduced in the early 2000s. 3G enhanced data rates up to several megabits per second using technologies like UMTS or Universal Mobile Telecommunication Systems and CDMA 2000. Uh, the signal type included wideband CDMA and CDMA-based technologies for data transmission. Some key capabilities, it introduced internet mobile access, video calls, and improved data services. The device size got smaller and more feature-rich smartphones with color screens compared to 2G and 1G. 3G brought faster rates and enabled mobile internet access, leading to the widespread adoption of smartphones and mobile data services. Going further with 4G LTE, or the fourth generation long-term evolution, 
This was introduced in the late 2000s and early 2010s. It introduced higher speed data rates ranging from tens to hundreds of Mbps using LTE technology. The signal type included orthogonal frequency division multiplexing or OFDM for data transmission. 4G offered significantly faster mobile internet, high quality video streaming, and um, VOIP, voice over internet protocol calls. The device size, it got sleek and powerful smartphones with advanced multimedia capabilities. And 4G introduced further a paradigm shift given that it brought a significant increase in data speeds, enabling seamless video streaming and fostering the growth of app-based services and mobile content consumption. And then we have the last generation, the current generation that we are using, 5G, or the fifth generation. This was introduced in the uh, 2010s. Um, the commercial rollout started around 2019. This introduced peak data rates up to several gigabits per second using technologies like millimeter wave and sub 6 gigahertz. It uses various frequency bands, including the millimeter wave and sub 6 gigahertz, as I mentioned, and the dynamic TDD. Um, 5G offers ultra fast internet speeds, low latency, support for massive IoT connectivity, and advanced applications like augmented reality and autonomous vehicles. Uh, the device size, it continues the trend of compact and powerful smartphones with the 5G support. Uh, given that we mentioned all the previous generations uh, of mobile communications, 5G introduced a bigger paradigm shift than the previous ones, given that it is a transformative technology that brings a, a huge shift in wireless communications. It facilitates the proliferation of emerging technologies like Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and cloud computing, and enables a wide range of applications and services previously not feasible with earlier generations. In summary, the evolution of wireless communication technologies from 5G um, starting with 1G has witnessed a dramatic increase in data rates, a shift from analog to digital transmission, the introdu introduction of advanced capabilities and services, a reduction in device size, and a significant paradigm shift with 5G as a transformative technology. Each generation has built upon the su successes and limitations of its predecessors, pushing the boundaries of mobile communication and shaping the way we connect, we communicate and interact in the digital age. In this slide, I am covering some common terminologies used for each of the wireless communication uh, technologies used throughout the years. Uh, for 1G, we use the Advanced Mobile Phone System, or AMPS. For 2G, we use Global System for Mobile Communications, or GSM. 2.5G, which was a generation in between 2G and 3G, was uh, GPRS and Edge. Then we move into 3G uh, with the Universal Mobile Telecommunication System, or UMTS. 4G with the Long-Term Evolution, LTE, and LTE Advanced and 5G, which is the digital technology uh, or new radio as commonly called. Let's talk about the differences between 4G LTE and 5G. We will start with 4G LTE. LTE primarily operates in the sub six gigahertz frequency bands, such as 700 megahertz, 800 megahertz, and 1.8 gigahertz, 2.1 gigahertz, 2.3, or 2.6 gigahertz, and others. It also supports some limited deployment in higher frequency bands, like 2.5 GHz and 3.5 GHz in certain regions. The resource frame. LTE uses a fixed size time division duplex, or TDD, frame structure, where the duration of the uplink and downlink subframes is fixed. LTE supports frequency division duplex, or FDD, in some bands, where separate frequencies are used for uplink and downlink. In terms of data rates, LTE offers peak data rates of up to 1 uh, gigabytes per second in ideal conditions. However, in real-world scenarios, the typical download speed ranges from 
5 megabits per second to 100 megabits per second, depending on network conditions and congestions. In terms of the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle context, LTE supports some basic vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication capabilities, allowing vehicles to exchange essential safety-related information within the scope of LTE direct mode and proximity services. In terms of the license spectrum, LTE primarily operates in license spectrum bands, and there is limited use of unlicensed spectrum for technologies like LTEU, which is LTE unlicensed, or LAA, or licensed assisted access. Let's now look into 5G. 5G operates in both sub 6 gigahertz and millimeter wave frequency bands. Sub 6 gigahertz bands include frequencies below 6 gigahertz, such as 600 megahertz, 3.5 gigahertz, and 4.5 gigahertz, which provide better coverage and penetrate buildings. Millimeter wave bands, which range from 24 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz and higher, offer extremely high data rates but have shorter range and are more susceptible to obstructions. In terms of resource frame, 5G introduces more flexible TDD and frequency division duplex configurations, allowing the network to dynamically adjust the uplink and downlink allocations based on traffic demand and channel conditions, leading to improved spectral efficiency. In terms of data rates, 5G is designed to provide peak data rates of up to 20 gigabits per second. In practice, users expect significantly higher download speeds compared to 4G, typically ranging from 50 megabits per second to 1 gigabit per second, or more, depending on the frequency band used, network deployment, and device capabilities. In the context of vehicle-to-vehicle, -vehicle, 5G significantly enhances vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication with ultra-low latency, high data rates, and improved network slicing capabilities. These advancements enable real-time exchange of critical information between vehicles, paving the way for Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, or ADAS, and autonomous driving applications. In the context of the analysis spectrum, 5G introduces new technologies like Citizens Broadband Radio Service, or CBRS, in the United States, and LAA, or License Assisted Access, in other regions. These technologies allow 5G to utilize unlicensed spectrum bands, for example, 5 GHz, alongside um, licensed bands, increasing the available capacity and improving the overall network performance. In summary, 5G offers several key differences compared to 4G LTE, including broader frequency band allocations, more flexible resource frame setups, significantly higher data rates, advanced vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication capacity, Let's talk about the 5G protocol stack. The 5G protocol stack is a hierarchical architecture that encompasses both the user plane protocol stack and the control plane protocol stack. These two stacks work together to handle different aspects of communication within a 5G network. Let's explore each stack in detail. The user plane protocol stack is responsible for handling user data and facilitating data transmission between user equipment, or UE, and the core network or other UEs. It focuses on the efficient and reliable transfer of user-generated information, such as voice, video, internet data, and other application data. The user plane protocol stack is primarily composed of the following layers. We have the application layer or layer seven. This layer deals with user applications and services. It provides interfaces for various applications to access network services. Examples of applications include web browsers, streaming services, and VOIP, or Voice over Internet Protocol apps. Transport layer, or layer 4, the transport layer is responsible for end-to-end -end communication and ensures reliable and ordered data delivery between the sender and the receiver. In 5G, the User Datagram Protocol, or UDP, and the Transmission con uh, Control Protocol, or TCP, are commonly used transport protocols. The Network Layer, or Layer 3, the Network Layer handles routing and forwarding of data packets through the network. It uses the IP, or Internet Protocol, 
to encapsulate and route data between source and destination services. We then proceed to the second layer of the data link layer. This layer provides error-free and ordered delivery of data frames between two directly connected devices. In 5G, the Ethernet protocol is commonly used in, wire, in wired connections, while wireless connections utilize the radio link control, or RLC protocol, for data link functionality. We have the physical layer, which says at the bottom of the stack, and layer it is layer one, the physical layer deals with the actual transmission and reception of raw bit streams over the physical medium, such as radio waves or optical fibers. It handles modulation, encoding, and decoding of data signals. Let's move to the control plane protocol stack. The control plane protocol stack is responsible for managing network signaling, control, and management functions. It handles tasks related to network establishment, maintenance, and control signaling between the user equipment and the core network elements. The control plane protocol stack consists of the following layers, similar to the user plane stack. The application layer. In the control plane, the application layer handles signaling protocols for network management, such as signaling for mobility management, session establishment, and authentication. We have session management or layer 6. The session management layer handles the setup, maintenance, and termination of user sessions. It is responsible for managing user context and session information. We then proceed to access and mobility management function or AMF, which is layer 5. The AMF layer handles access control and mobility management. It authenticates and authorizes the user equipment's access to the network and manages handover procedures during mobility events. We have the Session and Service Management, or SMF, which is Layer 4. The SMF layer is responsible for managing data sessions and services, including quality of service management and policy enforcement. We then proceed to the User Plane function, or UPF layer, which is responsible for the data forwarding and packet processing in the user plane. It ensures efficient routing of user data between different network nodes. The control and user plane separation, or CUPS. In 5G, the control and user plane functions can be separated for enhanced flexibility and scalability. This layer manages the separation and coordination between the control and user plane elements. At the bottom of the stack, we have the physical layer, which similar to the user plane, the physical layer in the control plane handles the transmission and reception of control signals over the physical medium. Together, the user plane protocol stack and the control plane protocol stack form the complete 5G protocol stack, enabling efficient data transfer, network management, and signaling between the user equipment and the core network. This layered architecture ensures seamless communication, supports a wide range of services, and enables the high-speed, low-latency capabilities that 5G promises to deliver. Diving deeper into the physical layer, following are the functions of 5G Layer 1, or also known as the physical layer. The first function is error detection on the transport channel and indication to higher layers. Further, we have FEC encoding and decoding of the transport channel. We have hybrid ARQ soft combining, rate matching of the coded transport channel to physical channels. Further, the physical layer is responsible for mapping the coded transport channel onto physical channels. It works on power weighting of physical channels, on modulation and demodulation of the physical channels, and frequency and time synchronization. Further, the 5G physical layer includes radio characteristic measurements and indication to higher layers, multiple input, multiple output, or MIMO antenna processing, and transmit diversity. Further, the 5G physical layer is responsible for digital and analog beamforming and RF processing. Further, let's cover some more layers of the 5G protocol stack. We'll start with the MAC layer, or the medium access control layer. This layer is a fundamental component of the 5G protocol stack and is responsible for managing access to the shared radio spectrum and allocating resources to user equipment. Its key functions include beam management and random access procedure. We then have the RLC layer or radio link control layer. 
This layer sits above the Mac layer and provides enhanced functionalities for reliable data transfer across the radio link. Next, we have the PDCP layer, or the Packet Data Convergence Protocol layer. This layer is responsible for header compression, encryption, and decompression to optimize data transfer over the radio interface. The Radio Resource Control, or RRC layer, is a crucial component of the 5G protocol stack responsible for managing radio resources and controlling the connection between the user equipment and the core network. The RRC layer performs essential functions to establish, maintain, and release radio bearers, which carry user data and signaling between the UE and the base station. Let's explore the key aspects and functions of the RRC layer in the 5G protocol stack. The RRC is responsible for broadcasting system information to NAS and AS. It's responsible for establishment, maintenance, and release of RRC connection. It is responsible for security, including key management, and it also works on establishment, configuration, maintenance, and release of point-point -point radio bearers. The RRC layer is responsible for mobility functions along with cell addition and cell release. Further, it works on user equipment measurement reporting, control of UE reporting, and UE-based mobility. Connecting in a 5G network opens up a world of possibilities, and it's not just about faster internet speeds. It's a transformative shift in the way we connect and communicate. This generation of networks uh, brings several innovations and connectivity options that redefine the way our devices interact with each other and the infrastructure. In this discussion, we'll delve into the various ways of connecting in a 5G network, including the ultra-dense network architecture with its multiple tiers of cells and the promising technology of device-to-device -device communication. One of the cornerstones of the 5G connectivity is its ultra-dense network architecture. It consists of multiple tiers of cells, including macrocells, picocells, and femtocells. Each of these tiers plays a specific role in enhancing connectivity and optimizing network performance. We have the macrocells, which are the largest cells in the network and provide broad coverage over large geographic areas, such as cities or rural regions. They serve as the backbone of the 5G network, offering um, basic coverage and capacity. We then have the pico cells, which are smaller than macro cells and are typically deployed in areas with high population density, like shopping malls or stadiums. They increase network capacity in crowded locations. Last, we have femto cells that are the smallest cells and are primarily intended for indoor use. They are typically deployed in homes and businesses. The main purpose of femto cells is to reduce congestion and load at the macro cell base stations. They offer localized high quality coverage, especially in places where signal penetration is challenging, like basements or office buildings. We then have device decision making. In a 5G network, the mobile terminal, such as a smartphone or an Internet of Things device, plays an active role in analyzing and deciding which type of cell to connect to. This decision is crucial for optimizing the user experience and network efficiency. The mobile terminal must consider factors like signal strength, data requirements, and latency sensitivity when choosing between macro cells, pico cells, and femto cells. For instance, if a device is in close proximity to a femto cell, it may choose to connect to it for faster speeds and lower latency. This intelligent decision-making process ensures that devices are connected to the most suitable cell type, enhancing overall network performance and ensuring seamless user experience. 5G networks bring a significant advancement in connectivity through direct device-to-device -device communication. This feature enables devices that are in close geographic proximity to communicate directly with each other without the need to go through a traditional radio access network. D2D communication is especially valuable in scenarios where low latency, high-speed communication is essential. For example, in autonomous vehicles, device-to-device -device communication can enable cars to share real-time information about road conditions, enhancing safety and traffic management. 
D2D communication um, also has the potential to revolutionize the Internet of Things, allowing devices to exchange data directly without relying on a cent central server. This can lead to more efficient and responsive IoT applications. This approach significantly reduces end-to-end -end delays and can lead to tremendously high data rates, making it ideal for applications like augmented reality, virtual reality, and gaming, where low latency and high bandwidth are critical. Further, we have the full duplex transceivers, which is another exciting development in the 5G um, connectivity. These uh, devices can transmit and receive data simultaneously on the same frequency, essentially doubling the data rate potential. Full duplex transceivers are expected to amplify data rates significantly, enabling faster downloads and uploads. This technology is particularly promising for bandwidth-hungry applications like 4K video streaming, high-quality video conferencing, and large file transfers. In conclusion, the ways of connecting in a 5G network are diverse and innovative. The ultra-dense network architecture with its various cell types ensures that users have access to the right level of connectivity wherever they are. Device decision-making optimizes the user experience, while device-to-device -device communication and full duplex transceivers pave the way for high-speed, low-latency connections that open up new opportunities for applications and services. Network slicing and non-terrestrial networks. Network slicing is one of the most revolutionary concepts in 5G technology enabling the creation of multiple virtual networks within a single physical 5G network infrastructure. This innovation allows network operators to tailor connectivity and services to meet the specific requirements of uh, different use cases and customers, ranging from consumer smartphones to industrial IoT applications. Uh, let's take an in-depth look at the network slicing in 5G. Uh, first of all, we have customization for different use cases. Network slicing enables the creation of isolated end-to-end -end network segments, each with its own dedicated resources and characteristics. These slices can be customized to meet the unique demands of various applications, such as ultra-low latency for autonomous vehicles or high bandwidth for augmented reality. Second, we have resource allocation. Each network slice can have its own allocation of resources, including bandwidth, computing power, and storage. This dynamic resource allocation ensures that critical applications receive the necessary resources while maintaining um, efficient use of network. We have isolation and security. Network slices are isolated from each other, meaning that the traffic within one slide does not interfere with uh, the traffic on the other. This isolation enhances security and privacy, which is vital uh, for critical services like healthcare or financial transactions. Further, we have service differentiation. Network operators can differentiate their offerings by providing premium, low latency, or high bandwidth services to customers, improving their competitiveness um, in, the mat or in, in the market. Non-terrestrial networks, or NTN, represent a revolutionary paradigm shift in the world of telecommunications. These networks extend beyond the traditional terrestrial infrastructure, enabling global connectivity through the use of satellites, high-altitude platforms, or HAPs, and other non-terrestrial means. NTN has garnered significant attention in recent years, especially in the context of 5G and beyond. NTN offers diverse technologies. We have satellite networks, which are a core component of NTN, geostationary satellites in high orbits, low Earth orbit satellites, and medium Earth orbit satellites are all used to establish connectivity over vast areas, including remote and underserved regions. These satellites provide global coverage and can support a wide range of applications, including broadband internet access, IoT, and emergency communication. We then have high altitude platforms, or HAPs, which are stratospheric balloons or unmanned aerial vehicles, which serve as the middle ground between terrestrial and satellite communication. They operate in the stratosphere and can provide connectivity to areas where traditional ground-based infrastructure is challenging to deploy. NTN offers global coverage, making it particularly valuable for connecting remote and underserved uh, regions where deploying traditional terrestrial networks is economically and logistically challenging. 
Further, NTN can deliver high data rates, including broadband internet services, making it suitable for applications requiring substantial bandwidth, such as high-definition video streaming, online gaming, and data-intensive IoT devices. Further, NTN helps with disaster recovery and resilience. It can serve as a critical component of the disaster recovery and emergency communication system. When terrestrial infrastructure is damaged or disrupted during a natural disaster or emergency, NTN can provide a lifeline of communication, ensuring that essential services remain connected. The 5G medium access control layer is a critical component of wireless communication systems, including 5G. It plays a pivotal role in managing how multiple devices access and share the available communication resources. The MAC layer's primary responsibility is to control access to the physical transmission medium, ensuring efficient and fair resource allocation while minimizing collisions and contention. In the context of 5G, the MAC layer has undergone significant enhancements and innovations to support the diverse requirements of modern wireless networks. The 5G MAC layer includes important concepts and techniques like dynamic time division duplex. This allows the network to dynamically adjust the allocation of uplink and downlink resources based on traffic demand and channel conditions. Furthermore, 5G MAC works on resource allocation and scheduling, it is responsible for assigning radio resources such as time, frequency, and spatial resources in massive MIMO systems to different user equipments, or UEs. Continuing with the concept of 5G MAC, this is responsible also for random access procedures. The 5G MAC layers handles random access procedures which are used during initial contention setup and when devices request access to the network. Furthermore, we have hybrid ARQ, or automatic repeat request. Hybrid ARQ is a retransmission technique employed by the 5G MAC layer to ensure reliable data transmission. One of the key MAC protocols used in 5G is the grant-based MAC protocol. This protocol is characterized by a central coordinating entity, often referred to as the scheduler or scheduler entity, which manages the allocation of resources to user devices. This is how it works. So this is in charge of resource allocation. In a grant-based MAC protocol, the scheduler allocates resources to user devices based on their requirements and network condition. This allocation includes time slots, frequency bands, and transmission power levels. User devices, such as smartphones and IoT devices, send resource requests to the scheduler. These requests specify their data transmission needs, such as required bandwidth and latency constraints. The scheduler evaluates the requests from multiple devices and determines how to allocate resources efficiently. It takes into account factors like quality of service requirements, channel conditions, and fairness considerations. Once the scheduler makes resource allocation decisions, it sends grants to the user devices, authorizing them to transmit data during their allocated time slots. This grant transmission ensures that the network operates in an organized and coordinated manner. User devices transmit their data within the allocated time slots adhering to the specified transmission parameters. This approach minimizes contention and collisions, improving the network efficiency. The grant-based MAC protocols can adapt dynamically to changing network conditions. The scheduler can adjust resource allocations in real time to accommodate varying demands and optimize the network performance. In contrast to grant-based MAC protocols, non-grant-based MAC protocols operate without a central scheduling entity. Instead, they rely on contention-based access methods where devices compete for access at, to the transmission medium. Here's how the non-grant-based MAC protocols work. So in the non-grant-based MAC protocol, devices contend for access to the medium by transmitting data packets whenever they have information to send. This results in a contention period where multiple devices may attempt to transmit simultaneously. Collisions can occur when multiple devices transmit simultaneously and interfere with each other's signals. Non-grant-based MAC protocols incorporate mechanisms to detect and resolve these collisions, such as carrier sensing and exponential backoff. To reduce the likelihood of collisions, non-grant-based MAC protocols often introduce randomization elements. For example, devices may wait for a random amount of time before attempting to transmit again after a collision. 
These protocols are known for their efficiency and scalability as they do not require a central scheduler. However, they may be less deterministic and may not guarantee certain QoS levels compared to grant-based MAC protocols. Non-grant-based MAC protocols are well suited for low power devices in scenarios with sporadic or low data rate traffic, such as uh, many IoT applications. The most widely adopted non-grant-based protocol for 5G is the non-standalone uh, or NSA mode. The NSA architecture can be seen as a temporary step towards a full 5G deployment, where the 5G access network is connected to the 4G core network. The NSA offers dual connectivity via both um, the 4G AN and the 5G AN. It is thus also called ENDC uh, for EUTRAN and NR dual connectivity. Cross layer interactions refer to communication and coordination between different layers of the communication protocol stack, such as the MAC layer, the physical layer, and higher layers like the network layer or transport layer. In 5G, cross-layer interactions are essential for optimizing network performance and efficiently utilizing available resources. Here are some key aspects of the cross-layer interactions. We have the interaction between the MAC and the physical layer, which is crucial for optimizing the allocation of physical resources and ensuring efficient communication. The MAC layer communicates with the physical layer to allocate resources such as time slots, frequency bands, and modulation and coding schemes. This coordination ensures that the physical layer uses the allocated resources efficiently based on the data rate and quality of service requirements specified by the MAC layer. The MAC layer may request specific modulation and coding schemes from the physical layer based on the varying channel conditions. For example, when the channel quality is good, the MAC layer may request a higher MCS for faster data rates, and when the channel quality is poor, it may request a lower MCS for improved reliability. The interaction between the radio resource control and MAC layer is critical for managing radio resources and establishing connections in 5G networks. The RRC layer is responsible for connection setup, configuration, and release. It communicates with the MAC layer to allocate resources for new connections and ensure that the necessary quality requirements are met. RRC informs the MAC layer about changes in connection status, QoS requirements, and mobility patterns. The MAC layer adapts resource allocations accordingly, ensuring efficient use of resources while maintaining the desired service quality. Uh, the interaction between the service data adaptation protocol and the medium access control layers focuses on optimizing data delivery and ensuring that different types of services receive the appropriate treatment. So the SDAP classifies and maps different types of services and their quality requirements to specific QoS profiles. The MAC layer uses this information to prioritize and allocate resources accordingly. The interaction between the session management and the MAC layer is essential for managing user sessions and their resource requirements. The SM layer establishes and manages user sessions, which may have different characteristics and QoS requirements. It communicates with the MAC layer to ensure that the necessary resources are allocated for each session based on specific requirements. Furthermore, the Access and Mobility Management function, or AMF, and MAC layer is focused on mobility management and efficient handovers in the 5G networks. When a user device moves between cells or access points, the AMF layer informs the MAC layer about the handover event. The MAC layer coordinates the seamless transition of the device, including resource allocation in the new cell, to maintain connectivity and QoS. Cross-layer optimization involves optimizing network performance by considering interactions between multiple layers, including the MAC layer and the layers above and below it. Cross-layer optimization aims to allocate resources dynamically based on changing conditions and service requirements. It considers input from higher layers, example application requirements, and lower layers, for example channel conditions, to maximize efficiency and meet QoS goals. By coordinating resource allocation and transmission strategies across the layers, cross-layer optimization can minimize end-to-end -end latency, 
which is crucial for applications that require ultra-low latency, such as autonomous vehicles and video, real-time video conferencing. The cross-layer optimization can also help reduce energy consumption by coordinating power-saving mechanisms, sleep modes, and resource allocation strategies. As a summary, in this first lecture, of the generalized physical and system architecture of 5G microcourse, we covered the evolution of wireless communication technologies from 1G to 5G, the differences between 5G and 4G LTE, the different ways of connecting in a 5G network, and then we covered the fundamental concepts of a 5G medium access control or MAC layer. It is time to check your understanding with the information that has been covered in this lecture. First, you can get started with the 5G toolbox from the MathWorks following the link provided in this slide. This documentation page provides information uh, about the 5G toolbox in general, its capabilities, and how it can be used to understand 5G better. Further, navigate the following hands-on example and answer the questions on the next slide. The example I've chosen to visualize the concepts covered in this lecture is the new radio cell performance evaluation with physical layer integration. Some food for thought, after you've looked at the example, answer the following questions. Which metrics are used to evaluate the performance of the NR cell in the example? Explain the significance in assessing system performance. Furthermore, which modulation scheme is used in the example? How does it affect the system performance? And third, how is the channel model configured in the example? What types of channel is used and what parameters are set? You can answer the, your questions uh, at your own time. There are two hands-on assessments that will help you better understand the concepts covered in this lecture that are visualized in the example. Task number one, modify the example code to change the number of user equipments in the simulation. Evaluate the impact of increasing or decreasing the number of UEs on the cell performance. So the expected behavior is a comparative analysis of cell performance metrics, for example, throughput, block error rate, for different numbers of UEs. Some hints. Modify the code to change the number of UEs in the simulation loop. Run the simulation for different UE counts and collect the performance metrics. And plot these results to compare the performance metrics and observe any trends or patterns. For the second hands-on assessment, modify the carrier frequency of the example code to 3.5 GHz instead of the default value. Run the simulation and observe the impact of the signal quality metrics. The expected behavior is a comparative analysis of signal quality metrics for example, SNR or bit error rate for the modified carrier frequency compared to the default value. Some hints, locate the code section where the carrier frequency is defined, modify the carrier frequency parameter to 3.5 gigahertz, run the simulation and collect the signal quality metrics, and then compare the signal quality metrics obtained with the modified carrier frequency against the default value. Thank you.